some people are more subtle in their approach to difficult topics than others. Uh, some, people would, some people you would say of them, well, that person should never be a counselor. Maybe they should never be a pastor. Um, they could be uh, something else in life. Well, when you re meet with Bildad, does his approach strike you as a very subtle one? Does he strike you as one of the more subtle and kind friends of Job? Or does he strike you as a fairly blunt and unsubtle one who you probably wouldn't want uh, to meet uh, when you were having a lot of troubles in life? What, what do you think? Compared to his other friends, anyone got a take on him? Uh, here he says, when will you end these speeches? Be sensible, then we can chat, etc." Is the earth to be abandoned for your sake? No. Yes, he's, he's pretty much the blunt one, or certainly blunter than Eliphaz. There's a little bit of pastoral tenderness, maybe, a little bit, with Eliphaz, and maybe with the other characters so far. But this chap tends to just say it like it is, with prickles sticking out, uh, as you may have noticed as Sean was reading that. And really, it divides quite simply, um, as they have more or less paragraphed it in our NIVs, verses 1 to 4, and then verses 5 through 21. <clears throat> and in those first few verses, Bildad says that Job wants to shake the world. He, he's saying Job wants the earth to be abandoned or the rocks to be moved. Why do you think Bildad is accusing Job of wanting the whole earth to be shaken or rocks, solid things that don't ordinarily move, or rocks to be moved? What do you think is going on? Why does Bildad say something like that? In what way is Job, has Job in Bildad's mind been asking for the world to be turned upside down, the rocks to be moved? Got any thoughts, anyone? Sorry? He's feeling sorry, yeah, but he might, want the, he might want the hills to start weeping, or he might want all the people of the earth to commiserate for that. But I think it's something more than just that he's feeling sorry. Is there anything in what Job has been saying that might lead Bildad in this direction? Yeah. They've got a solid idea of the way the world works, yeah? They think, well, the world works according to solid principles, not only the principles of physics that Newton and Einstein were yet to discover, but moral principles, right? And they're feeling, as Victor suggested, that Job is asking for some of the ordinary moral principles of the universe to be turned upside down. It's like asking the rocks to be removed or the earth to be abandoned for Job's sake. That's how they feel. Their world, their way of looking at everything and why things happen and why some people do well and other people do badly, Job is, seems to be trying to tip that upside down, right? And do we know or do you remember or can you figure out or do you know what, what is it about Job's sayings or Job's case that is shaking their world so much. That he's suffering, but it's not the big suffering of life. Yeah, he is clearly suffering. They can all see that. He's lost some of his family. He's lost quite a lot of his health. And yet, he's a righteous man, or claims to be. That They previously thought of him as a righteous man. Some of his friends probably still think of him a little bit like that. And yet they're accusing him now. They're saying, if all this has happened to you, Job, if it doesn't stop, it's proving that you are not a righteous man. You must have all kinds of skeletons in your cupboard. You better not try running for prime minister or high office. There'll be a lot to drag out of your background or your present or your motives or your attitudes. Yeah. Yes, innocent suffering. That is the 
thing that is shaking them so much. <coughs> and so Bildad is very blunt in those first four verses and is more or less saying, you're being stupid, you're undermining everything, how preposterous, we can't have that, and this cannot be. You are asking for the moral order of the universe to be turned on its head. And then from verse 5 onwards, there's one main topic, really. Uh, you see a reference to a wicked man in verse 5 and uh, an evil man in verse 21 at either end of this section. So it's really saying, verses 5 to 21, it's a description of the fate, the life of the wicked person. And when you look at it, it's not just the ordinary life of the wicked person. Uh, it talks in verse, in the middle there, in verse 14, for example. Uh, let's read again, verse 13, 14. It, uh, this is disaster and calamity, eats away parts of the wicked man's skin. Death's firstborn devours his limbs. He is torn from the security of his tent and marched off to the king of terrors. Now, what's that talking about? Not just somebody like Job having a bad day. Not just his kitchen ceiling falling down. Well, yes. It's talking about death and punishment. It's talking about death and judgment in some fashion, isn't it? And when you look outwards from the middle there, 13, 14, then that similar stuff is, is being said, really. His, his lamp is being snuff out, snuffed out right there at the beginning. Let's just take a quick look at the sections. We won't do it verse by verse, but section by section. Verses 5, 6, maybe 7, you've got the lamp of a person being snuffed out. Light is good. Here we are in England. Why do many of us try going to the south of France for our holidays? Because there's more light. Why do we not like this time of year too much, especially when it's like today? We like the light. Light is to do with joy and vibrancy. The light's taken out. He's, a person will be separated from the joy and the happiness of life. That's what light is partly talking about. Verses 8, 9, 10. What's that about? Not light and darkness. What's the main thought or the main word in 8, 9, 10? Can anyone see it? The main concept or the main word? Trap. Yeah. He's caught. He's snared in something. It isn't just his choice. He's being grabbed. Judgment, death is coming, and God's judgment is coming, and it's grabbed him, and it's not letting go. He's in a trap. Like a shark that's got hold of him. My mind's full of sharks because, like many of you, I'm watching all together now. Blue Planet 2. <laughs> That's 8 to 10. 11 to 13. Uh, sorry, 11 to 14, though we've already had a quick look at that. Yes, it's about death, and it's, it's about death and judgment. And also, notice the beginning of 11 and the end of 14, there's something similar. There's a common word there. Can you see it's... It's there in the English, it's something like that. It's there in the Hebrew as well. Terror, exactly, Neil. Do you realize ancient writers, before they had paragraphing and bold and spacing and stuff, do you know what they'd often do in order to show you this is a section? Do you know what ancient writers did? They do this right across New Testament, Old Testament, Greek writers, Roman writers, all these characters. Do you know what they do? Repet yes, and repetition in what sense? Yeah, they did paralleling in their poetry, but that's not, yeah, that, that isn't their section dividers. What they will often do is they'll include one word, phrase, or concept at the beginning of the section, and then they'll end the section, right at the end of the section, with the very same word, phrase, or concept. And it's called, the people who write books about this stuff use Latin, because that makes them seem more learned, I suppose. They call it inclusio but it just means inclusion. And the way you include something is you have a keyword at the right at the start, a 
a keyword right at the end, it's a paragraph. And that's what you've got, 11 to 14. It's a, a, it's a classic inclusio. It happens hundreds of times in the Bible. I'm not trying to give you a lecture on ancient literature. Well, I am in a way, because the Bible is ancient literature. <laughs> yes, so I am. But the reason I'm giving you a mini one-minute lecture on ancient literature is that this happens hundreds of times in the Bible. You will actually understand your Bible better if you bear in mind inclusio, would you believe? Okay, so it's about terror. It's a terrifying thing that we're going to die. We know that, don't we? You, you just switch on the telly many times or read a magazine, and people are quite often acknowledging, we don't like the thought of death, we want to avoid the thought of death. It's frightening. It is scary. And that middle section, 11 to 14, is about the scariness of death. And then as we go on, 15, 16, we're getting there towards the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Pray for me as well. I'm one of the sick to be prayed for, by the way. I have been coughing my guts up. Not quite, no. That's a slight exaggeration. I have been doing a lot of coughing for nearly two weeks, so I could do with prayer as well. 15 and 16, what's that about now? It's, he's got fire in his tent. His roots, are, so, you know, his roots are drying up. His branches are withering. Well, what's this about? Fire and withering and what's all that about? Is there a theme there at all, do you think? Yes. What aspect of death, destruction, or hell might that be, do you think, particularly? Unrecog not to be recognized, yeah. You might say something like, it's personal dissolution. Somebody is being ruined. They're, being, they're going to rack and ruin. They're, they're being burnt, or they're, you know, they're just being destroyed. It's the picture, really. It's a terrible picture of somebody being destroyed, I think, in uh, personal destruction, 15, 16. And then 17, 18, 19, 20, though there are a few things going on there. But I think there is one main idea there. Can you see a main idea in 17 through 20? Yeah, not well, yes, or non existence in this world, yeah. Yeah. It's removal. It's the idea of separation from the world, banished. Even his name's gone. His descendants disappear or don't do well. He's being banished and taken away. See, that's, it's, that I, it's that dreadful concept of separation that seems to be there. Okay, now that is, that's a look at what the passage is doing. Or is saying. So here is Bildad. He's, he's been pretty blunt, by implication at least, at the beginning. He's accusing Job of trying to tip the world upside down. And then from 5 through 21, he's describing destruction and what we might call, the Bible, I suppose, later on in the New Testament especially, does call hell. And he's got this grim five or six part picture or description of hell. And the implication of Bildad is what? What's the implication of this description? I mean, what, what has this ghastly description got to do with Job, would you say? Why, why is he doing this big description of hell? Well, yeah, I think that's, that is the implication that most interpreters pick up, uh, Neil. Yes, the implication seems to be, well, Job, it looks as though, from what's happening to you, and from the fact, from what's happening to you, Job, and from the fact that quite a few of these things are beginning to happen, you know, you are suffering in this direction, and it doesn't look to us that you're repenting. Instead, you're trying to tip the moral universe upside down. It looks as though this is your fate, Job. And it's truly terrible. And therefore, you must, and the implication is you are actually a wicked man, verse 5 and verse 21. Now, what do we make of all that? What is the message? What is, if that's what the chapter says, 
then we need just to think, don't we? Well, what, what is that saying to us? What is the relevance of that to us? And I think to get the relevance of it to us, we've got to examine it as we have a little bit, but we also have got to stand back and think for a moment. And we've got to think about the fact that you, you and I, the reader of the book of Job, knows that he is actually innocent. I mean, he's not spotlessly innocent, but he is a righteous man who loves, trusts, and largely speaking, obeys God. And yet he is suffering a great deal. And we know, therefore, that whatever truth there may be in some of the details of what Bildad says, whatever truth there may be, whatever scary and appalling uh, and quite helpful truth there may be in Bildad's description of death and judgment from 5 through 21, that the main thrust of what Bildad says in terms of Job is wrong, that the cap doesn't fit, and that this is very cruel. We've got to bear that in mind. The book as a whole, the other chapters, chapters 1 and 2, chapter 42, as well as a lot of what Job says, is telling us that much. So let me put it, let me try and summarize something that I think we are meant to get from it in this way. <clears throat> that justice is predictable. There is actually going to be a hell. Jesus in the New Testament and Paul and others in the New Testament are clear. There is judgment and punishment following death for those who are wicked and those who have not trusted God and have not received his forgiveness in this life. And justice, ultimately, in that sense, there is predictable. There is something steady and ordered and predictable about it. But that is only part of God's story. God is not only a God of justice, he is also a God of kindness and grace and generosity. And God has not condemned the whole human race to hell. And he has not written off this world, though we've rebelled against him. From right straight after the rebellion that is talked about in Genesis chapter 3, God has been showing kindness and generosity and undeserved goodness to human beings of all kinds. And when God's generosity and God's kindness come into the picture, then everything becomes, to an extent, unpredictable. You can't exactly predict it and measure it. Jesus in Matthew 5, 24, uh, Matthew 25, 45, says uh, famous words that God causes his son to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. Sorry, God causes the sun to rise <coughs> on the evil and on the good, Jesus says in the Sermon on Mount, Matthew 5, 45. God is generous. But then how much sunshine, how much blessing, how much success, how much money, how much good health, how much family happiness does one person, does one evil person have compared to another evil person, if you like. And it's completely unpredictable, and it's not measurable, and it's according to this love and the generosity and the sovereign, inscrutable will of God. There is something strange and unpredictable about life. And it's not that God is not on the throne. It's not that the world is just in utter chaos. It's that God is doing all kinds of things, including working in his grace and his kindness in ways that we cannot fully figure out. In fact, in ways that a lot of the time we can hardly figure out at all. And we need to reckon on that. So here, Job, in fact, is a man who does love God and is righteous, yet he is suffering at the moment quite a lot. Now, he doesn't know why. We've got a little bit of an inkling from chapters 1 to 2. But what we become aware of is that God's ways are past our full understanding. In fact, we discover 
uh, and we, as we read on in the Bible, we actually discover that Job, who was a man who loved God and was righteous, though not perfectly righteous, we discover that he is like one who was even more righteous. The most righteous person of all in the Bible was the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved God and obeyed God at every point. And what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? He suffered even more than Job. Why does God do this? What is going on? It is actually, ultimately, in Jesus. And in ways that we can't fully fathom out, no doubt it's something like it is going on in Job's life as well. It is part of God's plan of mercy. We remember at this time, we're in the first day of Advent, we are preparing to celebrate the most astonishingly strange, remarkable, humanly unexpected event in the whole of human history. Though it's amazing and strange that the whole world does celebrate Christmas, isn't it? It's a very funny thing. Does it not strike you as weird every year? All year, at least in the West, 365 days a year nearly, in the West, what do we have? We have very often people ignoring Christianity or deriding it or even getting angry with it or presenting a view of life that is very, very different to the Christian view of life in the moral realm, I suppose, rather obviously in recent years, but in all kinds of other ways as well. Uh, and uh, certainly any distinctive or unique claims of Jesus to be Lord and the only way to God, all of that is, is really very largely ignored or derided or hated in our public spaces for 364 days a year, if you like. That's true, isn't it? And then once a year, we have Christmas. And, and it's commercialized, and it's polluted, and it's defiled, and it's, you know, all kinds of things are done with it. But what's at the heart of it? At the heart of it is the greatest miracle recorded and claimed in the whole of this book, and, and almost the whole world is sort of going on about it. Very strange, very ironic. But what I'm trying to say is, what am I trying to say about that? What I'm trying to say is that God's saving grace is very different from his justice. Bildad thought only or largely about his justice. And his justice is real. And for people who do not discover or who reject his saving grace, there will in the end be predictable justice. And the dreadful things spoken of in Job 18 are partly a warning to those who might ignore or despise or reject or not trust God's saving grace. But in Jesus, in God himself somehow, the unique, supreme, eternal, infinite maker of everything at Christmas time, what is the heart of it is that this transcendent, unique God took on human nature, became a baby, became uh, a baby in the womb of what, what was very likely a teenage girl in Israel. It's an astonishing, unexpected, strange, almost bizarre thing to happen. It's it's in many ways stranger and more bizarre than what is written in the fairy stories of the ages or the sci-fi movies of the present. That the literally infinite God should, be, should, should become a human baby in a teenage girl. That's astonishing. Unpredictable. Now, it was, it was predicted by God. Uh, and, and some people may have managed to pick a tiny bit up before it happened. But it's a completely different kind of thing. That's the point. And God did that in love mm. and in mercy. And therefore, what we need to do is to reject Bildad's worldview, that we may accept we may some of his warnings and some of his stuff about justice very seriously, but we need to reject his worldview on the whole. And we need to say, God is not in our pocket. God has mercy. And whereas justice has to be meted out fairly, justice must be fair, mustn't it? We're up in arms, and we're surely rightly up in arms if there is injustice. You know, if there was a judge or a magistrate in England who let off 
some yobos who'd beaten up an old lady, and it was discovered that actually uh, he was buddies with the dad of those yobos, and he let them off as a favor to his buddies. There would be a scandal. He would be most likely sacked. Such a judge or such magistrates would be in massive trouble. Rightly so, because it's got to be administered fairly. But grace and kindness is a different matter. God's kindness flows to all. He gives, shows all kinds of kindness to all people. But how exactly he does it? In what manner? And how thickly he lays it on is actually in the hands of God. And there's all kinds of strange, unpredictable sovereignties of God about it. Do you remember, I'll close with this parable, just remind you of a, a parable. It's, in, it's recorded at the start of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, where Jesus talks about people, uh, a man who hired people to work in his vineyard all day, and he says uh, there that he hired some people at the beginning of the day and did a deal that they would get one denarius, which was like, I think it was like 100 quid for the day's work in those days. And then some people showed up three hours later, and, and he said, oh, work for the rest of the day. And then some people showed up at lunchtime, work for the rest of the day. So then some people showed up at five o'clock. And he said, oh, well, only one hour. Still, go and work in my vineyard. And some of them only did one hour's work. And at the end of the day, he gave them all 100 quid. And the people who'd worked for 12 hours were very cheesed off. And probably you or I might be fairly cheesed off. <laughs> right? But actually, 100 quid, a denarius, that was the standard rate. That was, that was actually a reasonable rate. And, and the, the owner says in Jesus' parable, and this is, I think, the point, and this is the alternative worldview to build that, which is why I'm ending on it. He says, the owner says at the end of it, he says, verse 15 of Matthew 20, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money, or are you envious? Because I am generous. And I think the point is, God is generous. And instead of quibbling and finding fault and all kinds of things like that, we need to not try and have a scheme where we feel we've got it all sussed out. What we need to do is know that in measure, to a significant measure, we're all actually sinners. Actually, in the end of the day, even Job was a sinner, though he did love God. We all need God's forgiveness. And God's forgiveness is offered to us in Jesus, the really perfect one who suffered in our place. God's forgiveness is offered. And what we need to do is not philosophize about it, but make sure we're trusting in Jesus. Make sure that he is the one we deal with directly. That we don't just celebrate Christmas and think a little bit about the incarnation as well as about all kinds of other things at the, the next four weeks. It's that we deal, every one of us deals directly with God incarnate, who is now alive and is Lord, and who is full of forgiveness and strength, and he, who gives the Spirit so that we can be remade, and so that we can grow in the new life that he gives. Jesus, who can keep us in fellowship with God the Father, despite our daily and weekly sins and failings. What a wonderful Savior. Jesus, who will stand up for us if we've come to trust him and love him at all in this life, he will stand up for us on that last judgment day as well. And the ghastly but true things of Job 18 won't happen to us. May that be so for us. And may we love our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues enough to want them to taste the same kindness. And may there be something of God's kindness in our lives so that they might even be willing to hear about his kindness through our lips. May it be so. Amen.